this is the forum on universities and labor standards in the global economy. And uh, just in case you're in the wrong plane, no, I mean, if you're just in case you're in the wrong room, no, you're fine. Here we are. So this then, this forum is being sponsored by several organizations on campus. One is the School of International and Public Affairs, the University Senate, and the Office of Student and Administrative Services. And I just would like to thank several people who have really helped make the forum possible. Honey Sue Fishman, who, <laughs> yay, honey. <laughs> who well, many of the students actually know very well, and we're very grateful for our efforts, as well as Rob Garris, who actually helped a lot from the SEPA end, so thank you. Also, President Bollinger asked that I extend his welcome to our distinguished panelists, and uh, apologize for him not being able to attend. He had a prior engagement. But the forum really is a demonstration of the university's ongoing commitment to devise ethical codes of conduct for our suppliers of local apparel. And Columbia University has invested a considerable amount of time and effort in ensuring the enforcement and maintenance of labor standards in the factories, factories that produce Columbia branded apparel, that is apparel that carries the Columbia name. And the key concern really is issues of oversight and monitoring. That is making sure our suppliers and licensees live up to our codes of conduct. And for this reason, we are active members of both the Workers' Rights Consortium who will, and the Fair Labor Association, which monitor factories that produce local apparel for the university. And we are very grateful for their heads uh, for being here today. And so thank you very much. And we're also very grateful for our distinguished discussants uh, who have contributed enormously to this debate surrounding labor standards in the, in the global economy and the need to balance uh, ec the labor standards and the enforcement of labor standards with economic growth and prosperity. So this forum then is really one of several steps Columbia is undertaking to encourage an open and balanced dialogue on these important issues. Now the focus here is going to be on the role of universities in this debate and universities play a very important role not because we are a huge part of the market or the supply chain or that we're d dominant in that in the textile area, but really because of the symbolic role that universities play. That is, we're the standard barriers of a global supply chain and our ability to balance human rights with economic imperatives will really be a measure of our success and an example to others. And with this, I'd like to introduce Lisa Anderson, who will provide the introductions for our panelists. And she is the Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs and the James T. Shotwell Professor of International Relations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me add my welcome to Professor O'Halloran's. I think this is a very important initiative. And I'm very grateful to her for having spearheaded it. All of you who are here and all of you who think about these kinds of questions recognize that one of the great boons of globalization um, in the modern era are not only the trade in goods and services, but the increased information all of us enjoy about how those goods are made and those services delivered. This in turn has led to growing attention to labor standards around the world. Now we need to do something about what we know about and to advocacy for fair standards and for f workers' rights and to impartial enforcement of such standards and rights. Universities, both as consumers of goods and services and as producers of ideas and information, play an important role in these debates, as Professor O'Halloran suggested. And so this is, as she pointed out, only one of a whole set of discussions and debates that need to go on, not, not only at Columbia, but throughout the world of higher education about what our responsibilities are and how we ought to be addressing those responsibilities. We're very fortunate to have a truly distinguished group of people to educate us and to include us in that debate this afternoon. Um, we have, serving ex officio, um, two leaders in this field. Um, Orrit Van Heeren, the president and CEO of the Fair La Labor Association, is here as president, but he has had a very long and distinguished career in advocacy on labor matters, um, bringing with him 
when he became the president of the Fair Labor Association in 2001, more than 30 years of experience fighting for human and labor rights around the world. He started that battle in South Africa as a very young student, um, serving two terms as president of the National Union of South African Students, um, and graduating with a degree in industrial sociology, uh, sociology from Witz in Johannesburg. He then spent several years in prison for his efforts um, before being ultimately released and um, then spent much of the succeeding decades in Geneva where he worked for the La International Labor Organization's program against apartheid. And after, after apartheid ended in South Africa, he was the labor attache in the South African mission in, to the uh, UN in Geneva. Um, he returned to the ILO in 1996 um, and then, as I said earlier, um, came to the Fair Labor Association in 2001. So we are fortunate to have him not only because he represents the Fair Labor Association, but because he has vast experience in this field. Joining him on the panel is the Executive Director of the Worker Rights Consortium, Scott Nova. Worker's Rights Consortium is a nonprofit organization comprised of more than 100 colleges and universities. Its mission is to monitor the working conditions under which college licensed products are manufactured around the world. Before joining the WRC, NOVA was executive director of the Citizens Trade Campaign, a national coalition of environmental, religious, human rights, labor, and other public interest groups. He's been a community leader and a community activist for his entire career, beginning in Rhode Island and then on to Washington. And he too brings enormous experience in these fields. They will talk to us for a little while and then we will hear from the professors um, on the panel who will give us a sense of the kind of issues that they think these kinds of questions have um, produced the sort of discussions that we have here at the university about what these kinds of dilemmas that we face, how we ought to be addressing them. And we also have not only two very important activists and leaders in this field, but two of the most distinguished faculty um, in the world, actually, who work on these kinds of questions. Jagdish Bhagwati is university pre professor here at Columbia and a senior fellow also in International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. He really needs no introduction to a group like this. He's been very active in issues on trade for his entire career, serving as policy advisor to GATT, to the WTO, to a number of um, regional organizations and so forth. He's um, also a very widely read commentator on trade issues, writing frequently in the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, um, foreign affairs, foreign policy, and so forth. His most recent book is In Defense of Globalization, which came out several years ago to very wide acclaim. And finally, on our faculty panel is Professor Mark Barenberg from the law school here at Columbia. His fields include labor and employment law, international labor rights, constitutional law, global economic institutions, employment discrimination, in other words, exactly the kinds of issues that we are interested in and concerned with this afternoon. His, um, he served as an independent expert for the ILO, the International Labor Organization, on the issue of corporate codes of conduct in China, and he's worked with several NGOs that monitor labor rights and compliance in China, and drafted several briefs and petitions pertaining to U.S. legislation and treaties that regulate the trade relationship between the United States and China. Um, he's also very widely um, read uh, in the field. So we're going to have a spectacular conversation, I think, this afternoon, and it will be moderated by Sharon O'Halloran, whom you have just met. But I want you to realize that she's not, if you will, merely the moderator this afternoon. She is one of the other of the faculty on this campus who is not only very involved, but also very highly regarded in the fields of trade and trade policy. She's the George Blumenthal Professor of Politics um, in the political science department and at SEPA here at Columbia. And she works on a variety of fields. This is not her only field. The p political economy of regulation, domestic determinants of international trade policy, electoral politics, redistricting, statistical methods, and comparative political institutions. So it's very widely um, published, wide-ranging interests. But she's the 
author of an important book on politics, process, and American trade policy. And it's from that line of research that she comes to these sorts of questions. She's served as an advisor, as have her colleagues on the panel, to a number of governments and um, international organizations on these sorts of questions. So we are extremely fortunate to have had an opportunity to bring together some of the most important people in this field, and I look forward to um, enjoying learning from them um, and thank them all for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. As moderator, my role is to lay out the logistics. And so what we'll have then is that each of our panelists from the FLA and the WRC talk for 20 to 25 minutes and give an overview presentation. And then our faculty discussants will all then speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. We will then open the mics up for questions and answers. And I will remind you that to make your questions brief and to be considerate and that they be the remarks be questions. So anyway, here we go. Start with uh, the FLA, the Fair Labor Association. Thank you for the introductions and thank you all for coming. I want to start off saying a few things about global supply chains, the cutting edge, if you like, of globalization. Something about the governance problems which that poses for us and specifically the role of the multinational companies, the way we situate it within those global supply chains and those governance issues. And then look at how we can respond, how we can address them and the range of responses and how they play out on the ground. So those are the three areas I'd like to cover in this time and then take the rest in, in discussion. As you know, for 30 or 40 years now, there's been the development of these global supply chains, partly because companies figured that if it takes $5 to make a sneaker, that you can subsequently sell for $100, you wouldn't want to be in the $5 bit of the business. You'd want to be in the $95 bit of the business. So outsource the $5 part to a low-wage country like China or Indonesia or Vietnam and keep the $95 part for yourself. And that's mainly designing and marketing the thing. So high-knowledge functions that you can keep in a developed country that you probably have to keep in a developed country while the low-knowledge, low-skill functions get outsourced to low-wage countries. So we saw this international division of labor developing, and countries who would not normally have been involved in this kind of industry, in this export industry, being allocated these functions. In the apparel sector, this was even a stranger process because you had quota. Um, developed countries allocated quota for exports to developing countries, and so countries who would never normally have developed an export garment industry suddenly got a whack of quota and found themselves in the export garment industry. Industries for which they had no other competitive advantage other than quota. So if you take Sri Lanka, it doesn't have wool, doesn't have cotton, doesn't have a textile base. None of the prerequisites for a garment industry, but it got quota. So Hong Kong and Taiwanese and other Asian manufacturers who were being denied quota went over to Sri Lanka, took advantage of their quota, and built up a significant export garment industry. 300,000 people probably employed in it. The problem was that those quotas were declared illegal and that from 1995, there was a 10-year phase-out period during which all of those quotas had to be eliminated. Of course, nobody phased much out until the last month of the quota system. So at the end of 2005, we saw the multi-fiber arrangement or the, the ATC come to an end and these, quote, these countries only competitive advantage wiped out. So they were suddenly exposed to all of the normal competition that you would have in, an export, in an, any export industry where you have to compete on your fundamental attributes and you don't have the artificial access granted by quota. And that meant that a whole lot of countries were suddenly looking at the meltdown of their export garment industries. They, of course, had had 10 years to prepare for this, and most of them didn't. And so there's been an incredible failure on the part of governments and policymakers to their workers and their industries to prepare for the international competition that they would have to face after 2005. As a result, 
most of those industries suddenly found themselves with investors or buyers saying, I can choose from the whole world. I don't have to go to Sri Lanka for quota anymore. I can now weigh up all of these sourcing options that I have and pick the one that makes most sense from a financial or an, e or an economic point of view. So we expect to see a major shakeout in these global supply chains. We had a number of countries who previously had a kind of privileged position in those supply chains, suddenly having to uh, face up to adapt to that shakeout. We expect China to be the big winner in this shakeout, other countries like India also to gain significant amounts of market share. But it's coming. It's been delayed slightly because of the curves which are placed on China, um, but which only last until 2008. So from 2008 onwards, expect to see a lot more churn in global supply chains as the industry finds, seeks out and, and establishes the most competitive export platforms. Now, that's what you would expect in the global market economy that we have. It's a global market economy which, as you know, has precious few rules. The rules that we have favor free movement of capital, free movement of goods, and increasingly free movement of labor. And they will move. It doesn't have the same level of regulation regarding social, and environmental, and other standards. So the social and environmental consequences of that free movement have not been factored into the equation. So while we have international agreements governing a lot of that, we don't have much of an international agreement on the consequences. We have ILO conventions and recommendations, which have been incorporated into many of these countries' labor laws, but right now they're honored mainly in the breach. The mechanisms which you would expect to enforce those international standards are pitifully weak. And in most of the countries that we've been working in over the last five or six years, we've seen those mechanisms decline. They're getting weaker. The bottom line is government's ability to enforce their own labor laws is declining. And I don't expect it to make a comeback anytime soon. Now, the reasons for that decline are many. Corruption in some countries, lack of political will in other countries, being overwhelmed by globalization is... is, is uh, is another factor. But the, the bottom line is that as we see free movement of capital and the free movement of goods accelerate, we are not seeing a similar increase in the levels of protection or the levels of regulation to deal with the consequences of those movements. So we're left with national laws, hopelessly inadequate in the face of these international developments, and national laws which are often not enforced. So to come back to my global supply chain, you've got the high value added functions in developed countries, the low value added functions capable of being produced in any range of developing countries. Very little protection, very little regulation. So the multinational company now is arguably the most powerful institution in the world today. Even The Economist magazine would agree with us on that. This institution is probably the least regulated in terms of its global operations. It has a global expanse which ex exceeds the, 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 the regulatory limits, the regulatory boundaries of any national state. It goes into these jurisdictions which are painfully unregulated. And so you have a kind of Wild West situation where it's up to the company to decide how it's going to organize its operations because, frankly, there's no one else on the ground who's able to create any effective boundaries to that company's operations. And the suppliers with which it then enters into business relationships are themselves equally unregulated, normally for other reasons, corruption, lack of enforcement ability, and so on. So you have a buyer and a supplier striking their economic bargain in a largely unregulated context. So the one option here is that we rely on the companies to do the right thing, the buyer and the supplier the right thing by not only their contract, but the right thing by the environment, the right thing by the society, the right thing by the workers. And just to give you one example of the kind of um, regulatory cracks that things fall through there, I was in Sri Lanka visiting the export processing zone. Spoke to workers, I spoke to trade unions, I spoke to NGOs about the situation. 
they told me, look, the big problem here is that foreign investors are not paying the social security deductions that they're meant to pay by law. So I took the accusation back. I went to the Export Processing Zone Authority. They have a labor inspectorate. And I asked them, are companies in the zone paying their social security contributions? They said, no. I said, well, why not? They said, look, you know, we're facing global competition. We feared that if we insisted that they pay the social security, that they would go somewhere else. So it's a trade-off we felt we had to make. So I asked them if they realized the cost, the full cost of that trade-off. It's a short-term trade-off to try and hold on to some foreign investors, but it, with long-term consequences for the society because all of those young women who are working in those factories are going to leave without their social security contributions waiting for them. And society is going to have to pick up that burden at some point in time. But that's the situation Sri Lanka believes itself to be in, that it has no bargaining power with the foreign investors coming in. And a lot of countries are making that kind of trade-off. So the multinational company going into Sri Lanka, either as a buyer or as an investor, is not going to be faced with a demand from the government agencies to pay Social Security. So what do they do? Do they take the course of least resistance and say, well, no one's going to make me pay these additional charges. Why should I? Or do they do the right thing? So that's one scenario out there. Global supply chains penetrate unregulated jurisdictions without any boundaries or any safety net. What do they do? Will they do the right thing? Will they do the wrong thing? As we know from the amount of information coming in, too many of them do the wrong thing, either explicitly or in, through commission or just through omission. The basic labor law rights, which every worker in those factories is entitled to, the basic terms and conditions that they're entitled to, are not being provided in too many cases. The Chinese government recently conducted a survey of facilities all over China, and they realized that something like 80% of workers did not have a written contract. Now, they had introduced a law in 1995 saying that every worker should have a written contract. And they're concluding now that 10 years later, most workers still don't have a written contract. As a result, they don't know what their minimum terms and conditions are, so it's anything goes. So the, at least the Chinese government is reacting. It is saying this is an invitation to abuse and exploitation. We have to stop it, so we're going to strengthen the law on contract. And there's a push right now in China to do just that. But the Chinese government is one of the only governments, I must tell you, which is staging a comeback, where they're saying we have too many unregulated aspects of our economy, too, many, too little regulation, particularly on the export sector and on foreign investment. We need to improve regulation, and as government will take steps to do that. Most of the other governments, I can barely think of another government, actually, that we are talking to, which is trying to increase levels of protection. They're all trying to lower the bar in the hope that they will attract more investment. Now, the, I want to get to the second dilemma here. Take a government like China, which decides to increase protections. Can it increase the protections? You've all seen the reports about mine accidents in China, the highest rate of mine accidents and, and, and injuries in the world by far. So a couple of years ago, the Chinese government looks at it. They inspect mines all over the country, and they order 6,000 coal mines to close. So unsafe, they cannot even be rehabilitated. The next year, they expect the level of accidents to go down, and after a couple of months, they realize it's not. It's still climbing. So they send the inspectors out again. The inspectors visit the mines and find that they've all reopened. Why? Because the mine owners had given local government officials shares in the mines. So even though government had tried to clean up the mines, it was thwarted by local levels of corruption. So the second option here of government regulation is not working even in the best cases. So we've got option number one, companies regulate themselves. Not a lot there to rely on right now. Option number two, government stage a comeback, start to regulate the labor markets. Not a lot of positive movement that you can talk, you can point to right now. So what's option number three? Option number three is you, civil society. You decide to 
find out how your products are made. You see a product you want to buy. You're bombarded by advertisement. You ask the question, how? How did this product become so cheap, so competitive, so desirable? How was it made? Where was it made? What conditions under which was it made under? And I'm not just talking about apparel and footwear. Wood. Next time you're going to Ikea, ask yourself, where did this wood come from? What do I know about the forest that this wood came from? What do I know about the environmental practices of this company? You build up that level of information. You access the information that is out there, and you start to put pressure on all of those players in the global supply chain and say, these are the kinds of ethical standards I expect if I'm to be a consumer of yours. If you want me to buy your product in good faith, this is what I need to know about it. These are the assurances that I need. Now ask yourself, who can give you those assurances? There are not a lot of organizations out there that can. Two of them are sitting here today. The one, the Fair Labor Association, arose out of exactly this dilemma. In 1995, there had been a series of scandals in the United States about labor conditions in global supply chains involving major brand names. And eventually, President Clinton called a meeting at the White House and said, look, I don't want globalization to be this race to the bottom. I don't know how to prevent it, but at least I'm going to use my good offices to get you all around the table to figure out a system to try and avoid these sorts of abuses. So they formed a White House task force, companies, NGOs, trade unions, Department of Labor. They spent four years fighting about what kind of a system they could put in place. And in those four years, a couple of crucial thresholds were crossed. The first one was that companies agreed that they have global responsibility for the way their products are made. That you cannot say, I didn't know what was going on out there. And you cannot say, it's not my factory. I don't own it, therefore I'm not responsible for it. It's your brand, you've got a duty to know, you've got a duty to do something about it. Second key threshold was that they agreed they would enforce the same basic rights and, and standards all over the world. They would not rely on local labor law. So adopt a code of conduct, base it on ILO standards, and set that as a level playing field wherever you do business. Third key threshold, they said, if we've got a duty to know, we'll send our own monitors out there to find out what's going on. Everybody else agreed that's a start. But how do we know that they'll actually be thorough? How do we know that they don't have a conflict of interest? How do we know they won't just brush it under the carpet? So there was an agreement that there has to be external verification of that auditing, a bit like the financial auditing system, internal audits, external audits. And the Fair Labor Association was set up to do that external verification. Well, we started to do that in 2001. And you might have seen in some of our reports, we found about 20 violations on average in every factory we visited around the world. So the compliant factory is not out there. It doesn't exist. And I'm talking about Manhattan, okay? I'm talking about any jurisdiction you care to mention. You find something in every factory you go to. That's no longer the issue for us. The issue is, are people willing to fix it? And that means, that is the local supplier willing to fix it? Is the brand or the brands buying from that supplier willing to engage to fix it? And what we found is that they did, but the problems came back. Too often, there would be engagement, an issue would be resolved, and a year later or two years later, we'd find that the issue has come back. So we said, okay, we're missing something here. The audits are identifying, we're having no trouble surfacing these issues. That's almost the easy part of it. What we're having trouble is coming up with sustainable solutions. So we, co we coined this phrase, sustainable compliance. And we said, what we need to do is expose the underlying root causes of these issues and start to address those. Because if we can't take, remove those root causes or address them effectively, they're going to provoke these kinds of violations time and time again. And that's taken us to places that we didn't expect to be as a labor rights organization. Let me give you one example. Hours of work, routinely violated around the world. Most factories with full order books are working more hours than the law allows. So you look at hours of work and you ask yourself, why are they working that, that many hours? 
we find that orders are often placed late. You know, fast fashion, everybody wants to place the order as late as possible, hold no inventory, have just-in-time delivery. So the orders get placed really late. The materials are ordered late. They arrive late. So before production is even started, you've got a series of backlogs that have to be made up. How do they get made up? Factory could become a whole lot more productive, but probably, rather than work smarter, they're just going to work harder. So they work nights, they work weekends, and they try and catch up that way. Plus, they've probably got a series of contingent factors which screw up production. Electricity cuts, monsoon, labor shortages add to the delays. So pretty, certain, pretty soon, by the end of the production run, they're going to have to work a full weekend to get it out on time. And they have to get it out on time because if they don't make the, the, the container ship, they have to air freight it, and that will wipe out their profit margin. On top of that, workers, because their primary objective is to make as much money, and many of them are coming out of contexts of poverty, and in labor markets where there's an oversupply of workers driving down wages, workers are willing to work excessively long hours as well. They're volunteering for overtime because they need the money, and poverty will do that. So we have an almost vicious circle of factors adding up to excessively long hours of work. So we've said, okay, we've got to address those. If we're going to get compliance on hours of work, we've got to be ready, willing, and able to address all of those contributory factors. And so that takes a labor rights group pretty quickly into areas like productivity and quality because you're helping the factory identify what's stopping it from working reasonable hours. And you're starting to do capacity building around those issues because you know if you can't build capacity on those issues in a, in a developmental process, they're never going to be able to reach compliance. So in our pursuit of sustainable compliance, we've learned that A, there are no quick fixes. It takes a lot of work, and it's a developmental process. B, it involves work not just on the rights components, but on the full spectrum of economic and production issues which that factory faces. I want to say something about some of the more elusive rights and these jurisdictions. Freedom of association, for example. A lot of countries either have a statutory defect on freedom of association, the law doesn't allow it or does not allow it fully enough. A lot of countries have practice, which is not favorable to freedom of association. And a lot of employers are hostile to freedom of association. Three factors which don't bode well for getting workers' representation and getting workers' collective bargaining. So this has been one of the most difficult challenges facing any kind of labor rights work. There's no doubt that the ultimate form of sustainable compliance would be when workers have representatives who are properly elected, properly mandated, defending their interests. You would not need auditors coming to a factory if those systems of representation and collective bargaining were operating effectively. The problem is that there are very few countries on earth which you can point to where those systems are working, and, where, and particularly even worse, where those systems are expanding right now. So that labor relations mechanism, that protective layer below the law, that protective layer of having organized employers and organized workers bargaining to resolve their issues and to defend their rights and interests is not effective at the moment. It's, it's got as many holes in it as the legal mechanisms above them. So we're in many ways trying to plug those holes. Now, one of the best long-term strategies for plugging those holes is promote organization. That's not our particular job, but our job is to hold that space open, to make sure that any worker who wants to form an organization or join an organization of their choosing can do that. And that space exists. And if, it, if anybody tries to shut down that space, we have a complaints mechanism which they can activate, which brings cases to us of anti-union victimization, and we go in there, we mediate those cases, and we create that space. It's one of the most important things that the FLA mechanism allows and that the FLA mechanism does. Every year, we have two or three of those cases in different parts of the world where we've been able to go in and establish that space to organize in jurisdictions which never had it before. However, if in the short term, organization, which is going to take time to build up, Organization and workers' representation is not going to be able to 
flood into those spaces. If labor inspectors are not going to be vigilant in defending those spaces, I think that the most effective option, the most effective strategy we have right now is educated and aware consumers putting pressure on multinational companies to enforce throughout their supply chains codes of conduct and then to work with local networks of organizations to ensure that they have on the ground capacity and ability to mobilize on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a um, multi-stakeholder basis to defend those issues. I'm going to leave you with a theory, it's not mine, but of network governance. That if we cannot rely on national states to defend rights at work, and we cannot rely on labor relations systems to defend rights at work, that what we are going to have to do is to construct alliances of stakeholders to fill that regulatory vacuum. And that those alliances of stakeholders will include multinational companies, local companies, buyers and suppliers, local NGOs and trade unions, and even on rare occasions, local government agencies. And that those networks will come together and say, we need to regulate this. They'll mostly be reactive, responding to crises, but in some cases they may be proactive as well. And that we will come to rely, we right now, in fact, are relying on networks to regulate these unregulated jurisdictions. The multinational company is without a doubt the most powerful of all of the actors in that network. And it's going to take the combined weight, the combined pressure of everybody else in that network to ensure that it does the right thing in each one of these situations. And it needs forums in which to do that. The FLA is one such forum. We have the companies at the table, we have the universities at the table, we have NGOs at the table, we have local partner networks. We can hold companies accountable. And in our, in our latest generation of monitoring, FLA 3.0, we're building in new accountability mechanisms, new ways of tracking performance over time. Because it's that transparency and that accountability which is going to be our only, I don't want to say guarantee, our only effective response to ensuring that companies do the right thing in regulations, in environments where no one else is demanding that of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. The next speaker will be Scott Nova from the Workers' Rights Consortium. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, and I particularly want to thank Lisa for the very kind introduction. You know, I always have to laugh a little bit when I'm introduced as a distinguished panelist. This may be in part because I often find myself on panels uh, with speakers whose academic credentials are far more extensive than mine, and certainly with uh, Professors Berenberg and Bhagwati here today is no exception, but also because I think about the literal meaning of the word distinguish, which simply means that you are being differentiated, standing out in some way from others. And of course, one can stand out for something good, but one could also stand out for something bad or even embarrassing. All of this is, is, is by way of preface to an apology to all of you, which is that I will be distinguished today, I think, as the panelist who engages in the most sniffling and throat clearing. Uh, and that's because I'm getting over a cold. And so I apologize in advance for the, the extra sound effects. I, I want to talk uh, today about, uh, well, about a number of issues, but, but really one issue in particular, and that is the reasons why efforts to improve working conditions uh, in apparel factories around the world have not been more effective. Uh, we're now uh, into more than a decade of codes of conduct, uh, codes uh, and monitoring programs that have been embraced by virtually every significant brand and retailer in the world, not to mention all of the so-called multi-stakeholder organizations, NGO involvement, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the university codes, of course, which, which in my view are, are the best of the bunch. And uh, despite all of that, despite a great deal of work, despite literally hundreds of thousands of audit reports about factory conditions and an untold number of conferences and seminars and multi-stakeholder dialogues, we've seen relatively little progress on the ground. 
there are certain issue areas, for example, child labor, where there's been some significant and sustainable progress. But on many of the fundamental issues, and Arette referred to a number of them, including freedom of association, forced overtime, and so forth, there really has been very little progress. On wages, globally, there's been virtually none. In fact, in many countries, real wages for apparel workers are lower today than they were a decade ago uh, or more when the code of conduct discussions began. So we're left to, to grapple with the question of why. Now, I don't want to be entirely negative because we have seen at the individual factory level some significant gains. And we do know from that experience that codes of conduct and independent codes, like university codes in particular, can be a tremendously effective tool at the factory level for generating sufficient pressure on factories to cause them to actually improve their labor practices, even to go so far as to accept the right of workers uh, to organize a union and bargain collectively. It can be done at the factory level, but we haven't seen that enough. We haven't seen enough change at enough factories, and perhaps more importantly, we've seen that it's been very hard to sustain the changes made at individual factories. The gains have proven to be quite fragile. So even where there has been progress, it's progress that's been limited in many significant ways. So we're left to grapple with the question why. And I think in, in trying to look at this question, it's important to, to go back uh, to some very basic issues. To consider, first off, who and what are we dealing with when we talk about labor rights violations around the world? Who are the key players in the global apparel industry? And of course, the most significant players, uh, the truly key players in the global apparel industry are global apparel brands and retailers. Uh, they have the most power in the system. They have the most financial resources. They have the most political clout. Uh, they have the most bargaining power in dealing uh, with other players. They're the most important actors. And the decisions that they make, the policies they adopt, the practices they carry out are by far the most important determinants of what actually happens on the ground uh, for workers. So we need to look for a minute at these institutions, these global apparel brands and corporations. And in looking at them, I want to, to state what I believe is a truism of, about corporations and large multinational corporations in particular um, that some, some people might view as, uh, as not a truism, uh, but, but I believe it is. And that is that the primary purpose of global corporations is to make money for their shareholders. They are not labor rights organizations. They will never be labor rights organizations. Their top priority will never be labor rights. They will never be as committed to the goal of ensuring respect for the rights of workers as unions are, as student activists are, as universities are. There will always be a tension, a struggle, a push and pull when organizations like unions, like student groups, like universities, attempt to move those global apparel brands and corporations in the direction of more respect for worker rights. We'll push, they'll push back. Now, I don't mean primarily to describe this in moral terms. It's just important to understand what corporations are as institutions, what their purpose is. Indeed, it's worth noting that under the incorporation laws in states, in the United States, it would be illegal for a corporation to make labor rights goals its top priority because it has a legal obligation to make its top priority return for shareholders. So we are dealing with institutions that by virtue of their legal obligations, their structure, their history, their purpose, their internal and external dynamics are not going to be advocates for labor rights, are not going to be allies in the effort to achieve greater respect for worker rights. Different corporations will behave differently at different times. There will be individuals who work for corporations, who will be wonderful people, who will be hired to be labor rights monitors, who will do their absolute best to carry out that responsibility in a way that is beneficial to workers. But as institutions overall, we must recognize, in order to analyze the problem properly and understand the right solutions, must recognize that global corporations are never going to be full partners in the effort to achieve respect for worker rights in the apparel industry or for that matter in any other industry. So as we look at this very difficult question that we must answer if we're going to move forward, which is why, despite all of the discussion, all of the institution building, all of the factory audits, all of the seminars, all of the codes, all of the monitoring, why are we not seeing more progress 
for workers on fundamental issues. And I think we need to recognize that the answer to that question uh, is fundamentally very simple. It follows the, the uh, precept of Occam's razor, which I'm sure people are familiar with, which is that when dealing with uh, a conundrum, the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. And in this case, I believe the simplest explanation is the correct one, and that is that Global apparel brands and corporations, including university licensees, are not yet at a point where they are ready to make a sufficient effort to generate respect for worker rights in their supply chains. They haven't done enough. They haven't, as institutions, committed themselves to the goal. And it's important to understand that there is a difference between the public representations that any entity makes and what it actually does in the real world. And if we look at the behavior of global apparel brands and retailers over the last decade, including university licensees, I think we see very clearly the proof of this hypothesis, that the reason why brands have not achieved respect for worker rights in their supply chains is that they have not actually made a sufficient effort to achieve that goal. And I want to give a couple of examples of why I feel the proof for this hypothesis is so strong. A simple a point, back to freedom of association, the right to organize and bargain collectively in more colloquial terms, an absolutely essential worker right, recognized by most countries around the world, not all but most, as a fundamental human right. And yet, as Arendt noted, a right that does not exist in most apparel factories around the world, including in apparel factories producing for major global brands and retailers like Nike and Adidas and Gap and others. Indeed. Legitimate independent unions are an extraordinary rarity in the supply chains of these major global brands and retailers. You would be more likely to find a Republican at a Dixie Chicks concert than you would to find a legitimate independent union in the supply chain of Nike or Adidas or Gap or Liz Claiborne. All right. Nonetheless, there is, there is recognition and acceptance to their credit. The brands and retailers have accepted this is a problem that has to be dealt with. They've embraced freedom of association and their own codes of conduct. Not much progress yet, they've embraced it. All right, if the goal is to achieve compliance with this critical code of conduct provision and that the corporations themselves have adopted in their codes, uh, respect for the right to organize and bargain collectively, what, what would a corporation do in order to, to manifest that commitment in reality in order to achieve respect for associational rights in its supply chain. Well, one thing you would do is you would not concentrate production in countries where it's illegal to form a legitimate independent union. I think that's fairly obvious. You would not concentrate, you would not choose to focus your productive activity countries where it's illegal to join an independent union. And yet, in the wake of the phase out of the multi-fiber arrangement, the quota system that Arette described, we are seeing a huge shift, and we'll see a far greater one uh, after 2008, toward China and Vietnam, other countries as well, but China and Vietnam in particular, as the primary focus of apparel production for the very same global brands and retailers, including university licensees, that have stated that they believe it is essential to ensure respect for the associational rights of workers. I do not believe if the global brands and retailers were at the point they need to be at, better put probably, I don't believe if we had succeeded in moving them to the point where they need to be at, that we would be witnessing and would ultimately witness uh, this massive shift to countries where it is simply impossible for that fundamental right to be respected no matter what brands and retailers do in terms of code of conduct enforcement. Uh, what else? We have seen a relatively small number of factories where as a result of the intervention of universities through their codes of conduct, where workers have made great strides toward achieving respect for their fundamental rights, including the right to organize and bargain collectively. Uh, real breakthroughs that must, I think, first and foremost be attributed to the courage and the perseverance of workers, but which also I think it is fair to say could not have happened had universities, had students, had monitoring organizations that universities helped to create not gone out and used university codes of conduct as a tool to put pressure on those factories 
to respect the rights of workers. So we have seen in a small number of factories these wonderful gains, these important breakthroughs. Unions, uh, a union organized in a factory for the first time uh, in the history of a free trade zone. Workers achieving a wage above the legal minimum for the first time in the history of a country. Uh, workers in a country where health insurance for workers is legally mandated but almost never provided, actually achieving this health insurance. And as a result, their children getting to go to a doctor, in some cases for the first time in their lives. Tremendously important break breakthroughs, which accrue tremendously to the credit of universities as moral institutions. And in the majority of cases where such breakthroughs have been achieved, the factories have subsequently closed. And they have closed because they have not been supported by the very same university licensees that claim that they are dedicated to ensuring respect for the rights of workers. Instead, we have seen production shift away from factories where those breakthroughs have been achieved. We have seen factories where those breakthroughs have been achieved pressured to lower their prices at the very same time that they are incurring higher costs exactly because they have embraced the labor standards in university and corporate codes of conduct. And finally and more generally, the third piece of evidence of why uh, I believe the hypothesis I outlined is correct is that university licensees and brands and retailers in general have not done the basic things that a global corporation would do if it intended to achieve full and meaningful implementation of its code of conduct obligations in its supply chain. What are some of those things? Well, let's begin by noting uh, the reality of global supply chains at present, or where they were when the code of conduct work started a decade ago. Vast supply chains uh, maintained by major global brands and retailers, hundreds, thousands, in some cases tens of thousands of factories. Tremendous volatility in these supply chains. Brands and retailers jumping from one factory to another. Short-term contracts. So the factory never knows whether its relationship with the brand is going to extend past the current run of t-shirts, which might just be a few more weeks. No long-term relationships. Instead, great volatility, jumping from factory to factory. And tremendous downward pressure on the prices factories receive for their products. There is overcapacity, excess capacity in the global apparel industry. There are more workers who want to make apparel than there are jobs. There are more factories that want to produce apparel and sell it to brands like Nike and Adidas than there are orders from brands like Nike and Adidas to go around. The result is that when the brands negotiate prices with factories, they have tremendous bargaining leverage. Understandably, predictably, unsurprisingly, they play one factory off against another to drive the price down. Factories understand this. They know that if they will not meet the price demand of the brand, that the brand will find another factory across the street or across the world that will meet the price. And so the only way to keep the business is to meet the price. This is the reality that we began with when codes of conduct were first being discussed and implemented. Now, I, I, won't, I don't want to take too much time. We can get into a bit more perhaps in the question and answer. But there is a basic conflict between that environment and the goal of ensuring respect for worker rights. For example, it costs more to produce under good conditions than bad conditions. It costs more to pay the minimum wage than to pay less than the legal minimum wage. It costs more to buy mandatory safety equipment, finger guards on sewing machines for workers so that they don't get needles through their fingers, for example. It costs more to buy that equipment than it does not to buy it. It costs more to compensate workers properly for overtime than to stiff them for the overtime hours that they work. I think this is all very obvious. It costs more to produce under good conditions than bad conditions. And yet factories during the very period of time, this decade of codes of conduct, when they have been told that they are supposed to be improving working conditions from the pretty bad norm at which they started, the poor conditions we all recognize have prevailed in the industry, during the very same time when they've been told that they have to improve these conditions, improvements that will unavoidably increase their production costs, they're told by the very same brands and retailers who are telling them to improve conditions that, oh, by the way, you also have to cut your prices. There's a fundamental conflict there. There is a fundamental conflict between the goal of ensuring long-term sustainable respect for worker rights and highly volatile supply chain relationships. If your relationship with a factory, if you're, you're the brand, your relationship with the factory uh, is only one season long. 
and yet you're telling the factory it's got to make all of these fundamental changes, do things it really doesn't want to do. Accept a union? Are you crazy? It's being told it has to do these things it would never otherwise do by a customer who makes no commitment to the factory beyond next week or next month. Obviously, a factory is much less likely to do that if it, if it does not know that the customer will be around to back it up and support it if it goes through those changes. A related problem, in most apparel factories, there are multiple customers who usually do not represent more than a relatively small percentage of the factory's business. Nike might buy 10% of a factory's product, or 15. Adidas might buy 20, or 2, or 4. Same problem. A factory is being told to make painful, costly, undesirable changes that clashed with the business culture, clashed with managers' ideology, clashed with everything they know about what it means to be a good manager, which among other things is keeping out unions. They're being told they have to make these changes by a customer who represents 6% of their business. Why would they make those changes for such a customer? A customer who represents 6% of the business and is making no commitment to them beyond next week or next month. These are the fundamental conflicts. The atomization of the supply chain with each brand representing a small portion of a factory's business, the lack of long-term relationships, the intense downward price pressure, these all conflict in a direct and extremely destructive way with the goal of ensuring sustainable respect for the rights of workers. So if a brand or retailer genuinely intended to accomplish the difficult work of achieving full respect for the rights of workers, throughout its supply chain, not the occasional piece of progress, fragile piece of progress, but full respect for the rights of workers throughout its supply chain, what would it do? It would change some of those practices. It would not pay factories a price for their product so low that the only way the factory can possibly meet the price is to run roughshod over the rights of workers. It would instead accept that the prices it pays to its suppliers are going to be slightly higher in most cases. And it would commit to the principle that the price the factory receives must be commensurate with the cost of producing under good conditions. What else would the brand do? It would maintain long-term relationships with factories. And it would consolidate production substantially so that it isn't 6% of the factory's business, but 26 or 36 or 46 or preferably 56%. So it has far more clout over that factory. And when a factory does make genuine progress, when fair prices and longer-term relationships and commitments facilitate real progress, the brand would stand by those factories that achieve progress. Factories that embrace the labor standards we're all asking them to embrace would be rewarded instead of the current system where factories that improve conditions and thereby incur additional costs and less flexibility. They can't make workers work 24-hour shifts to get an order out, for example. Factories that make the improvements we're asking them to make actually become less competitive in the marketplace because brands and retailers will not accept a higher price and will shift the order to a factory that may be claiming that it also respects worker rights but has not, in fact, really made significant improvements and therefore can offer a lower price. If brands were serious, about accomplishing these goals, fully accomplishing them in a timely manner. They would pay factories a fair price, they would maintain long-term relationships, they would consolidate production, and they would reward good factories. And the fact that this has not happened, and this is true far beyond university logo apparel, it's not specific in any way to university licensees, the fact that in general the apparel industry has not done this, the key players, the brands and retailers, is overwhelming proof that they are not yet serious enough about achieving these goals, and we have to find ways to make them more serious. A couple minutes? Okay. So, I wanted to make one other point in this context, if you'd bear with me just one sec. Ah. So, and I, 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 it's also important just to think about it from a common sense perspective. Let's take Nike. They're on my mind now because we're involved in this disagreement with them over this, this uh, factory that's made real progress on labor rights that's closing. Uh, in the Dominican Republic with the production being shifted to, to Vietnam. So I'm thinking about Nike. Okay, Nike's a $10 billion corporation. Um, it is a larger economic entity than many countries. It has one of the most widely recognized brand images in the history of the world. I don't know if, if any of you have ever been privileged enough to receive a, a business communication from Nike in writing a letter. But if you have, you may note that they don't actually even put Nike on the letterhead. It's just the swoosh, just the mark. That's it. 
And they do that because they believe and expect, and they're probably right, that, that, that this is a universally recognized symbol, an enormously powerful corporation. Is it really plausible? Is it really plausible that Nike does not have the power and the ability to ensure that workers in factories making its clothing and footwear have their rights respected? Does Nike really lack the ability to do that? Is, is, it, is it plausible to conclude that the reason Nike hasn't achieved that is a lack of power, a lack of competence, a lack of creativity? Or is it more likely lack of a sufficient effort? And I think looking at it from a common sense standpoint and looking at the overwhelming evidence, we have to conclude it's a lack of effort. Now, Nike is better than a lot of other brands and retailers. That, that, that should be noted. That, that's good. It's good that they're better than Walmart. It's good that they're better than Kmart. It's good that they're better than Tommy Hilfiger. But the difference between Walmart, Kmart, Tommy Hilfiger, and Nike is much smaller than the difference between where Nike is today and where they need to go in order to ensure full respect for the rights of workers throughout their supply chain. So the Worker Rights Consortium uh, supports a particular solution to this problem in the context of, of university codes of conduct and university logo apparel production. Uh, and the solution we support is something called the Designated Suppliers Program. And some people here are familiar with it, and we can talk about it in more detail if people want to. But in a nutshell, what the Designated Suppliers Program is, is a set of requirements to be imposed upon university licensees that simply ask them to do the things that they should have done over the last five years, the essential basic things necessary to achieve respect for the rights of workers in their supply chains and comply with their university code of conduct obligations to honor the labor rights principles enshrined in the Code of Conduct of Columbia and numerous other colleges and universities pay a price to factories commensurate with the cost of producing under good working conditions, stabilize the supply chain and consolidate it, Make, have long-term relationships with suppliers, and reward the factories that do the right thing. Reverse the economic incentive. So instead of punishing the factories that make progress by creating a situation where factories that make progress and have higher costs can't get a fair price for their product, Reverse the incentives. Reward the factories that make progress on labor rights with more business, with longer-term commitments, with fairer prices. Factories will respond to that. And that, in a nutshell, is all that the DSP is, an effort to get the brands and retailers, uh, the brands that are, operate in the university logo apparel context, to do the things that they need to do and should have done and must do if they are going to achieve uh, full respect for the rights of workers uh, in their supply chain. And of course, we're hopeful that that approach uh, will ultimately uh, be taken. We certainly appreciate uh, the qualified support that, that Columbia has provided uh, to this program and, and the participation uh, of Columbia's representative, Honey Sue Fishman, on the working group, uh, which has been uh, tremendously appreciated to develop and hopefully ultimately implement the designated supplier program, but it will only go forward if, uh, if uh, many more universities decide uh, to embrace it. And I hope, and I hope that that will happen. And I want to conclude by, by noting again that, that none of this is intended as a moral indictment of any of the individuals involved here. Corporations are, are not individuals, they're institutions. And they should be judged as, as institutions. And so I hope people will not interpret my comments as a criticism of any of the individuals um, who do the, the labor rights work for the brands. Some of whom I should note in our experience are themselves quite dedicated and try very hard, but are badly constrained uh, by the policies and practices of the corporations uh, that they serve. It, it is an institutional problem. It's a structural problem. It's one that, that can be solved. It's one that needs to be solved. The changes we're talking about are in fact, in many ways, the kinds of ideas that the brands themselves have been talking about for years. They talk about the need for consolidation. They talk about the need for longer term relationships. They acknowledge that the way that they place orders often forces factories to, to engage in illegal forced overtime and excessive overtime. They talk at meetings and seminars about all of this stuff, but they haven't enacted it in their supply chains. And so again, all the DSP is, is an effort to get the brands to do what they should have done and need to do minimally to achieve these standards, many of which are ideas they themselves have already at least rhetorically embraced. Thanks very much. I look forward to your questions and comments.
Well, thank you very much. And now what we'll do is we'll turn it over to our discussants, and we'll start with uh, Mark Berenberg, who is a professor of law and has been very active both in the, the WRC and in this debate, and this debate that the Senate and the university has actually taken up, and we really do thank his participation and his contributions. Thanks. Um, so I'll just sit here. Um, so I, I've inspected um, many factories for the universities. Um, I inspected a factory in Mexico where uh, supervisors hit the workers with hammers to make them work faster. And uh, when they peacefully <coughs> protested and tried to form their own democratic organization, factory managers bludgeoned them again, this time with clubs rather than hammers. I inspected a factory in Indonesia where supervisors locked workers in solitary confinement if they complained about working conditions. Once uh, the workers were released, they were then followed round the clock and terrorized by thugs hired by uh, managers. Um, these were factories that had been inspected over and over again by uh, corporate labor auditors. And uh, the university inspections gave some help to these workers. And in order to do that, the universities had to uh, pragmatically construct a new style of uh, monitoring in light of the failed experiments of the, the corporate monitors. Monitoring had started out as a, as a highly limited or, or superficial process. Um, the ground level inspectors went into a factory for an afternoon or a day. They did a walk through, they talked to managers, uh, and then they interviewed workers for a, a few minutes inside the factory in, in management offices. Uh, the inspectors saw what managers wanted them to see and heard what managers wanted them to hear. And this superficial process is still the norm in monitoring when corporations inspect their own factories or when they pay so-called independent monitors to inspect their factories. And we now know that, that to get real improvement in working conditions, uh, it's impossible to do it using the superficial method, uh, especially deeper uh, improvements in the deeper problems that we see uh, in garment factories uh, around the world. If the factory is forcing workers to, to do overtime, to take work home at night without getting paid, it, it's not good enough to have a monitor parachute in for one day and then not come back for six months or a year or, or two years. If the managers uh, act in subtle or not so subtle ways to promote a fake union that signs a contract but doesn't do anything to actually represent workers uh, and process their grievances but to the contrary helps punish and penalize workers who complain, the monitor can't root that out by occasional visits to the factories. So. We know that monitoring, if it's to be at all effective, has to be instead highly labor intensive. And over time, the WRC developed a, a labor intensive method of monitoring with, with the help of a lot of students and, and faculty across uh, many disciplines. WRC monitoring teams uh, spend as long as a week interviewing managers and workers and local officials, local NGOs. Uh, the teams include experts in domestic labor law, international labor law, occupational safety and health, wage and hour calculation, and also include uh, advocates uh, from the local factory community. The team interviews workers in lengthy interviews, some structured, some unstructured, but not on company property, uh, in, instead in confidential locations, in their villages or their homes, uh, in local restaurants or courtyards. And then for weeks or months before the formal monitoring, a staff person or a local ally on the ground uh, does intensive gathering of, of background information and develops relations of trust with the local community to make it possible to do the intensive week-long formal investigation. After the formal investigation, the WRC keeps in close touch with developments in the factory through a local accountability team that acts as a kind of ongoing monitor to make sure that the 
uh, organization can keep abreast of new developments to verify whether the factory is complying with remedies, to work with <coughs> managers uh, collaboratively to uh, ensure sustained remediation. Now, so no one yet has the resources to do this kind of monitoring across thousands of factories. So the DSP responds to this crucial problem by consolidating production in a smaller number of factories, as Scott explained, where we can do this kind of intensive monitoring in a, in a systematic way. Um, we can't easily rely on ad hoc local groups to do the long-term monitoring and verification uh, of the kind that we've, we've tried um, uh, to carry out with the accountability teams. Uh, the DSP responds to this uh, by requiring that the factories remain strictly neutral when workers create their own worker organizations, whether they take the form of a union or some, uh, some other form of, uh, of representation or participation. Uh, on the principle, as, as both Scott and Orette said, that it's really an, only an organization of the workers themselves that can ensure day-to-day -day monitoring and verification in real time and not long after the fact when it's too late to repair the damage. Um, as Scott said, unless factories are required to raise wages and brands are required to pay prices that allow that, we won't make any headway in actually raising living standards for export workers, uh, the key to ending sweatshops. Um, now, there's yet another big challenge to the success of monitoring um, uh, a set of problems that I think are not often acknowledged. Uh, the interventions needed for success need to be deep and wide in the sense that the intervention has to extend beyond workplace organizations structurally and geographically beyond uh, factory gates. Uh, the intervention ex has to extend beyond workplace organization because we found that local factories and, and managers are, are deeply enmeshed with local political hierarchies, local party structures, local rogue police and military uh, apparatus, local development agencies. Uh, the intervention extends beyond factory gates because the factory workforce uh, is embedded in a labor market that reaches across factories as workers are churned by uh, mobile capital and labor markets that stretch from the factory community to the villages uh, from which the young export workers migrate. If you want to make managerial structures transparent and accountable, you find yourself confronting the lack of transparency and accountability in the entrenched political systems that are mutually supportive of abusive managers. If you want to protect the rights of workers who are part of this wider labor market, you have to address management policies that take advantage of the peculiar vulnerabilities of workers who are expendable and fungible and whose labor is subsidized by uh, village and, and family networks and by the informal sector in and out of which they move. Now, the designated supplier program won't and, and can't magically solve these enormous intractable challenges or dimensions to um, successful monitoring. But still, stabilizing production in a smaller number of model factories will help. First, because the stabilization of production entails the stabiliza stabilization of employment and to some degree contains the, uh, the entropy of labor market structures. Second, because the very hard work of, of disentrenching and destabilizing resistant local hierarchies uh, need not be endlessly replicated when production isn't endlessly reshuffled across thousands and thousands of factories. Um, so the DSP, uh, I believe, is, is the next step in best practices in monitoring, and even though it's it's pretty bold. It's still pragmatic in, this, in the best sense. It, it builds on the, the hard lessons that, uh, that we've learned where the rubber hits the road.
Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So our next discussant will be Jungdish Bakwadi. I'm afraid I'm going to be one slightly dissenting voice, so let me just say that uh, my two students, uh, Jeffrey Sachs and particularly Paul Krugman, who have attended more classes with me than Jeffrey Sachs, were quoted about 15 years ago in the New York Times by a reporter called Aronson uh, at a Kennedy School uh, celebration as saying there were, diff you know, sweatshops were the way to go. Uh, for development. So I wrote a letter to the New York Times saying, you know, low wages is one thing, but um, conditions of work is something else. Uh, they garbled it, and finally it sort of did come out, but I, uh, I just want to establish my credential that uh, I'm not entirely unsympathetic to what you guys are doing, and actually I particularly admire you, Oren, because, you know, the anti apartheid movement was a, you know, very risky one, and, you know, I... Unfortunately, I grew up before the independence movement uh, succeeded in India, so I was the only one in my family who escaped jail. Um, but such is life. Um, okay, so and I often discussed with uh, John Sweeney, uh, who is an amiable, wonderful man, uh, and I've said that, you know, I belong to a generation, I'm 72, where you never cross the picket line, because that's the way we were brought up. Uh, and then, because he's a man not given to great humor, uh, I added, and it's not because I didn't come across one. <laughs> uh, I mean, I have come across picket lines, but didn't have across them. Nonetheless, I want to raise questions about what we heard uh, and how we want to proceed. And I, I was the one who insisted that we, rather than talk about labor standards, uh, talk about them in the university context, which the two of you are particularly interested in because labor standards and domestic environmental standards <laughs> crop up in a variety of contexts, including in U.S. labor policy today, trade policy today with the new Democrats. But that's a different bag of tricks, and that's a different question to find. So we, I want to raise the, the, the university question. Since Oren started with, so let me just do a tiny bit of quick economics as I understand it on the issue. Because Oren started by saying what, in fact, a lot of people think, uh, Namely, the final output price of a, an Ancline jacket might be $195, and the workers producing it in Guatemala, say, uh, get only $5 or $4 a, a, a day, maybe $5 a week. So there's a huge discrepancy, right? So Eileen Applebaum of the EPI, Progressive Economic Policy Institute, has written about that. Uh, I was in a debate with this big man, Trumpa, whatever, you know, and he was... I forget what the context was, but he was told not to do any dramatics. Well, of course, he suddenly pulled out a T-shirt, a sweatshirt, and said, exactly, you know, this was the pay, wage paid for this was so much, and we are charging you so much. Well, it was fine, but that is a standard concern, right? Or standard way of proceeding. Uh, I would just like to, as an economist, to say, that's not a good way to proceed. There are other ways in which you can get at what some of you are interested in, because there's no relationship really necessarily between the price of an output, which is a gross value, and what to, you know, and wages, which are a component of value added. All right. So it's just my wife's hometown where they polish diamonds, right, in Surat on the west coast of India, and Antwerp is another one, right. They don't produce any diamonds, so you import diamonds, raw diamonds worth 10,000 bucks, say. Polish it a little bit, sell it at $11,000. So the value added is only 1000 right? And therefore, of that, let's assume workers are paid well. And so they get maybe, say, half or one-third. That's still a tiny fraction of the value of the exported diamonds. So it means nothing. So when you take also things like... I mean, in a specific context, it may mean something, okay? But as a general form of argument, it's simply not very helpful because this is simply something not you, you, you can really deal with it this way. Now, take the Ancline jacket. They probably make 10 jackets, you know, and all the <laughs> women here, well, you know, there's several jackets you don't like. So a lot of them, you know, don't work out. So maybe one out of 10 works. So you've got to deflate the average value of the jacket down to 
one tenth or one ninth or whatever you want to, you know, I'm, having lived in this country, I'm no longer good at arithmetic the way I was when I arrived. Um, so you have, you bring it down. Then you've got payments for tariffs. You've got scaling up by 100% once you land on, you know, on the docks and then get to the retailer. By the time you've done that, it doesn't look quite so melodramatic. Well, therefore, I don't like that form of argument for, for these reasons. Uh, and I think, you know, I mean, I, I don't blame you guys because you're activists, right? You, you're distinguished in my world. I didn't say it. <laughs> but Eileen Applebaum is an economist who was with EPI. She should know better, and this is not the way you want to argue. So, okay, so, so those are um, some of the que questions which I would raise about whether we are exploiting our workers. Two, when we get to the specific industries like text, textiles, it's a highly competitive industry. So another way to look at it is to say, is anybody making excess profit in this game? Right? But it's a highly competitive free entry and free exit, much like restaurants along Broadway uh, kind of industry, rapid turnover. Therefore, you, when you look, go and look at the profit rates which are being made, they're not all that dramatic like with pharmaceuticals and so on. So it's not as if firms are making dramatic profits which they should share with our workers, all right? So those are the kinds of things uh, why I don't like a specific form of economic argumentation. Uh, and then I'll, you know, I won't be parting company with you altogether, <laughs> but this is the form of argument which I personally don't think is gonna get us very far in terms of trying to do something about working conditions and so on. And the third thing, of course, is wages are low. And this is where I do disagree sharply with, the, uh, with your designated supplier program, which is that, you know, true. You're not for minimum wages. Now, if you read any textbook, uh, I mean, you're for living wage, right? So once I'd given an interview in for a magazine called Lingua Franca on it, and it folded right after, maybe because of my interview, I don't know. <laughs> But then George Rupp, who was our president, sort of got me to testify before the committee. And so I go up and they say, uh, the students were very actually interested in discussing the living wage. But I was told by the faculty, which is usually inflexible on these questions, because they don't think about these matters. I mean, they're doing other things. And so they said, oh, tell us how to calculate a living wage. So I said, I'm, I'm not an engineer. I'm an architect. I want to discuss whether there should be a living wage. So the guy said, you know, no, no, you can't do it. But many of the students said, you know, we would like to go and discuss with you. And since I earn a living wage by any definition, right, I could do more. <laughs> I said, you know, let's discuss this. Now, the trouble about the living wage is that it's a completely arbitrary concept. Right? I mean, I have one view, you have another view, Sharon has another view. So I don't like that approach as part of the prerequisites for a program. I worked with SA8000, which is a pioneering agency, as you know. Uh, and Alice Mar Marlin is going to be here on, on 18th, I think, to discuss CSR. You know, so I'm on that panel and I'm pro CSR. So that did not have a living wage. Now it may have, because you know, I've been away for three, yes. and there was a sort of beginning to move in that direction. But I think this is exactly the wrong thing to have, in, you know, simply because it's totally arbitrary. I mean, where do you draw the line? And if you really go and say, you in India should have a living, or say even a minimum wage which should be enforced, that's the standard thing we have in many clauses and trade, trade treaties and so on, which is what we demand. Uh, that is because as anybody who knows legislation, how cynical it is, you know, I mean, there's a story about how Republicans, uh, or rather Democrats, to please Democrats, we put in high tax rates. And to please Republicans, we put in the loopholes. So that way, you know, we, we get bipartisan consensus on this. When minimum wages are not really being enforced, we, you just put in everything under the sun, like two children have to go to Swarthmore, and so on and so forth. So if you look at the legislation on minimum wages in India, it's dramatic. You know, I mean, the best in the world. You know, something which would make you feel you were really measly. Uh, but it's not meant to be enforced. It's not meant to be enforced. So when it comes to even minimum wages, or any wage legislation, 
we have to take into account that just, just like in our country, in these other countries also politics gets cynical, all right? And people don't really mean it. So, and sometimes even if legislation remains on the books and you, you can't really get rid of it, you'll have to rely on the Supreme Court, which is down there today, uh, to the wrong one, Alito. <laughs> and so that is where you expect, therefore, you know, some kind of legislative, you know, executive action, if you're lucky, uh, or some kind of, you know, intervention by the courts and so on, but you basically cannot touch the legislation. So today I'm told the adultery laws still in New Hampshire or Vermont, or maybe both, no one has been able to touch them. So if President Clinton is going through, he's going to be in trouble if we get those states to enforce the laws, right? So do, are we going to do that? No. So when we say you must enforce your own laws, that is also problematic. So I'm just simply saying that there are problems as you go down the line on the wage dimension. All right? So now let me come to basically kind of agreeing with some of what you, you're trying to do. And that is that I do think working conditions are important, very important. Now, how do we try and get at them? Now, do we get it? through the kind of activity you're doing with us universities. And that's a question I want to raise. Because, true, if you were to say you've got to have higher standards, and if they're not just simply a matter of being virtuous without any cost, then of course there's no consequence and everybody will embrace them just to please all of us, right? But because they have cost, and which is what we are trying to do, uh, to make sure that they wear goggles when they're in front of blast furnaces and all sorts of, not full OSHA, but at least some part of OSHA, all right, because they're poor countries. If we want to do that, then do we have, who pays for it, right? And that is an important issue. I think you could take, instead of going down the route of saying, what all of you who presumably belong to this anti-sweatshop coalition, you and the DSV suppliers would like a particular vector of characteristics to be a precondition for supply. I would say, well, there are dozens of things one can think of, which I think are good, which you will not agree with as, as being good. So I'm living in a university. I would say I, we want more diversity, more, you know, a variety of different standards, and not like I strongly object to living wage as a simply arbitrary uh, and creating problems for people uh, and for, you know, for developing countries. So I would like a different set of characteristics, maybe a developing country standards. After all, you know, we are here. Now, of course, you're from Africa, so I mean, you know. So, but you've been here, like me, for a long time. But I think we, we could have a variety of uh, standards, so all of which you know, we might say, look, more or less are in the right direction, right? Like they satisfy global compact or something. And so we allow for more diversity. And I feel that, you know, your, your specific views or their specific views should not be rammed down my throat because I, I belong to a university where dialogue, debate, different views are really important. So this is my view about university standards. You can go and arrange boycotts and all sorts of things elsewhere. So when you take fair trade coffee, for example, that's another thing like what you're trying to do. Um, if you say Starbucks must carry only fair, fair trade coffee, I think that's, that's not appropriate. So when I went to, to see Hillary Benn, the, the British minister, uh, about two months ago, uh, they only had in DFID, the Department for International Development, just the fair trade coffee down there, a little kiosk. I didn't mind because, you know, all the people there thought this was a great idea. And, you know, that's what the British Aid Agency does. But when it comes to Starbucks, I would like to see variety. And if we want to pay for it, because that's the way I want to define my altruism and my sense of, you know, rights for the workers, that is fine. And then I have to worry about whether that money is going to go in the right sort of way, who's going to do the monitoring. And I might want to do my altruism by doing something else, not through fair trade coffee, because essentially I'm paying a premium, right, on, on the market price, and which is perfectly reasonable. I mean, you know, and I did drink the fair trade coffee. So, uh, I had no choice, but <laughs> still I did in, in London. So I feel that we really want to open up choice, right? 
and what you do is perfectly fine by me, right? Because that's what you're concerned about. I'm also concerned about, but I'm more concerned also about whether we can effectively enforce this and whether, in fact, other ways in which I might want to help, maybe communitarian work, playground building, H, you know, HIV AIDS work, anti-malaria. I mean, that's where I want to put my money, so I don't want to put it into what you think is really important. I do consider <laughs> workers' rights to be important, as I said, but I don't want to have the university tell me that I should just stick to this one. Now, some of you may think workers' rights are so important that they're like, you know, apathy or something if you, if you neglect them. But, but I think that degree of intensity of preference on, on workers' rights is unlikely to be shared widely. Uh, if, if it was shared widely, you would have quite a lot of you know, concerted boycott action and so on. I don't see that. Uh, and therefore, I rely to fall back, therefore, aside from the diversity issue, just the last point, and I'll finish with this, on the fact that economics does tend to help us in terms of rights. Uh, because, I mean, you see that in China. Of course, as, uh, you, know, you, you need regulations. I mean, I'm not saying don't have regulations. And we've got to push governments through moral suasion, also private boycotts, which, you know, willing parties will want to do, and so on. You can do a variety of things to try and push people into the right kind of legislation on workers' rights. But then, it's economics kicks in. In my country, India, there's huge amounts of very good legislation on the books, but it just sits there. And what you really want is growth, et cetera, to be able to kick it into action. Because it's just sitting there, the, Scott, your kind of frustration really begins to be important, right? So I would say that really, um, you see that in China to some extent, in the Guangdong provinces, the very rapid growth, you know, two-digit growth over about a quarter of a century, and combined with you know, one-child policy in the area, and very little infrastructure for Marx's reserve army of labor to come in. You've got a huge demand for labor, and you know, a restricted supply of labor compared to the sort of figures which Tom Friedman produces. So you really have had improvement in wages, according to everybody who has talked, and you've had also improvement in working conditions. And so I think that is something we ought to, to, to kind of emphasize. Of course, so corporations do help. They're not wicked any more than some professors are wicked. Uh, fortunately, they're not here. <laughs> and that is not the way to think about it. They are making a contribution. They need to be regulated, as Mark is saying, because without, without a series of don'ts and mechanisms to try and monitor and so on, they will do terrible things. I mean, there's no question. One counterweight, of course, is the NGOs and the civil society, which all of you were talking about, in which the students are actually are interested. Because the NGOs bring the reputational problems to light. Because the little guys you can't really do anything about, the little furniture makers who went across to the maquiladoras at the time of the NAFTA, I mean, nobody knows what they're doing. Uh, and it's not worth the cost. But the big, big firms... They, can't, they, are, they suffer a reputational loss. And this happened with Nike in, in, in uh, was it Hanoi? Where, you know, they put those w women out who were chattering or something into the sun, much like in, you know, Bridge on the River Kwai, where, you know, Alec Guinness is put it outside. Now, that's also another thing. I think we need to worry about the how it is done. Because all the time I read, well, you people are knowledgeable, I want to ask you afterwards. You always hear about some... South Korean manager in a Nike factory somewhere in Guatemala or something. And my sense is that, you know, while we Americans do terrible things too, uh, on the whole, we have a tradition. We've been through a, re you know, a reformation. Uh, we have civil society. We have liberal values on the whole, you know, with the, with the dip we had under the Bush administration. Um, and so it's highly unlikely that an American manager will put out women to work, you know, in the sun, for, for just for, for talking on that. So I think we also need to go into that as to, you know, how do we educate the guys who just come in just to make money, right? So Nike is not going to do that. I mean, it just got caught in it with its pants down. 
But it's, I think so. Again, I think we need to probe that. I'm entirely in favor of what you guys are doing. But when you sort of jump to the conclusion that we really should try and get the universities down to doing this, I don't think it's such a good idea for the universities. Uh, and I don't think it's a good idea generally. I think our, your cause is so good that you can use moral suasion, private boycotts, and a variety of techniques which will really get you there. If you're trying to sell something really nasty, <laughs> then you wouldn't be able to appeal to people's good instincts. So in a way, the, we are underselling um, the power of, you know, the, to do good. And so this, this, I mean, I could go on, but I have to stop. Thank you very much, Changdish. <laughs> and I'm sure we will go on. So what I'd like to do now is invite the, you to come up to the mics, and uh, we'll do questions at that time. And please, if you have your remarks, please put them in the form of a question. We're going to have a student. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Um, it's a little short. Um, uh, this is like a multi part question, and I'm not sure if somebody did address it earlier and I had missed it, but um, when the standards were established back in the 90s, was there a, uh, also a penalty regime that was established with that? And how is that implemented if there is? And if there wasn't, is it fe feasible to establish uh, some type of penalty um, system that um, is imposed upon the uh, country as a whole in um, that they would be uh, rated by the independent auditors and if they were to fail, get a failing grade, then the pen the, that country is in some way trade-wise or something penalized and also this penalty system would also um, be put upon the import companies so that they would lose, I don't know, maybe tax breaks that they get from the from their home country or some, some system like that so that it, it, it hits both ends of the, uh, of the line and that uh, it would also um, uh, favor the companies not running away from these countries that are keeping the, the higher standards and looking for the countries that are avoiding them because everybody would be in the mix. It'll, all the countries they would go to would be subject to these penalties. Okay. Would uh, Scott, you'd like to take the first crack at that one? Well, I, um, just very, very briefly. I mean, I, I think it's a question that, that is probably more applicable to the issue of potential trade legislation. Right. And of course, there, there are, in bilateral trade agreements to some extent, there are labor rights obligations. But I actually, just to, to <clears throat> get into the substance for a second, I actually think one of the good things about the university approach has been the focus on the factory and its customer in the United States, as opposed to the country. Punishing an entire country uh, is a rather blunt instrument. And one of the things that's critical to realize is and this is not to defend uh, malfeasance, sloth, or corruption uh, on the part of uh, governments or their labor rights enforcement agents, but there are reasons that have to do with the nature of the global marketplace why countries in the global south don't aggressively enforce their own labor standards. And it is because those governments largely correctly believe that one of the main reasons why their countries attract foreign investment and foreign buyers for products made there is because they don't have the kinds of strong enforced labor standards that you have in the industrialized world. So there's a fear that if they did in fact strongly enforce their labor standards, that actually be penalized in the marketplace and production and orders would shift to other countries. And so it's not a problem, it's not reasonable to expect an individual country on its own to solve that problem. And I think it, it's interesting, Senator Dorgan uh, has a bill uh, which focuses on the importer, makes the importer responsible for a product that is made under overseas under uh, sweatshop conditions defined in a certain way and penalizes the importer. My own view is that's a better, a better approach and a more effective approach. I mean, as I said in my comments, the key players here are the brands themselves, the global brands based in the U.S. and Europe, 
uh, that they that they drive the car. Did you have a question? Mark Berenberg described the WRC model of monitoring. I wonder if Orrett could describe the uh, FLA model. And in particular, I noticed yesterday that the country, uh, re the factory reports are no longer available on the website. So I wonder what's going on with your, your monitoring approach. Okay. The, our model, Scott, interestingly, Scott was just saying that the brand is the institution which drives these global supply chains. And so ours is based on brand accountability. And you were asking earlier, you know, we were talking earlier about the reputational risk which brands face. And that's really the power of the FLA system is that a brand signs up to it, agrees to give us their entire supply chain. So they give us all their factories. We then run, we expect them to install the code at all of those factories and to conduct internal monitoring. We take a sample, a random sample of around 4% of their, of their factory list and go and do unannounced external audits there. So you can imagine as a company signing up to the system the confidence you've got to have in, in, in your program because you're handing over to this organization your entire factory list saying you can pick a factory, go there unannounced, audit it for two days, look at the wage records, look at the hour records, interview workers, examine anything you like and publish the results. So if you're, not, if you're just trying to talk the talk, you're not going to sign up to that program because you've got to be walking the walk or you'll get exposed. We, we are still publishing our factory reports. If you, if you didn't find them yesterday, it must just be a, a, a temporary, maybe the site was down or something, but we are still committed to that transparency. And we're trying this year to actually make them easier to read because the, the information there is very dense and a lot of people complain that it's, it's, it's hard to extract. So you can go to any one of those brands. You can click on Adidas. Click on Vietnam, you'll find a factory where there was sexual harassment in the factory. So that's, for a company like Adidas with its reputation, that's an incredible risk to take. Let us go find sexual harassment and publish it. What we do then is we give the company 60 days to fix, to address that problem. So they've got to go in there, put up, set up a corrective action plan and implement it. And we report out on that as well. So we're not just reporting the bad news, we're reporting what they've done about it as well. And that's the balance the company's then got to strike. They've got to do enough to convince you, the consumer, that they're addressing those problems. So I think it's a, it's a very powerful system. And for a brand, a company whose most valuable asset is their brand, the reputational risk is enormous if they don't do what, they, you know, what they're permitted to do. Yes. I think I have uh, two questions. The first question. Could you please identify yourself? My name is Paul Intim, student um, CPA. Great. Yeah. I have two questions. The one question is on the uh, labor abuse, wherever they are found. I want to find out whether the abuse we've been able to separate intended abuse and unintended abuse. And in the case of unintended abuse, uh, based on circumstances, maybe poverty and other things, maybe children are working. In that situation, I've been able to go to the field and supported whatever the government is doing to get some of these things <coughs> corrected. That was the first question. And the second question is to look at um, the use of the consumer to maybe boycott a brand because that's an element of uh, labor abuse along the production line. And I want to find out uh, how this model will help developing countries, for instance, because the power of boycotts is not likely to be the same. So if um, your usual consumer to boycotts, you know, brand, can developing countries also survive in this context? Because if, for instance, um, Coffee, for instance, um, is known to be uh, children are involved in production of coffee, and therefore, you know, you are using the Western power to, you know, buy a production of coffee or supply of coffee. And then there's a product exported from maybe Western world to developing countries. In that case, would the developed countries also have the same power to, to buy a that product? That is the, the issue I want you to address. Thank you. 
Okay. So there were two issues. One was the boycott issue and the ability of developing countries to boycott those as an effective tool. And the other one is how do you understand the difference between attended and unintended consequences associated with the development and poverty and working with it? Yeah, right. Right, so those are the, those are the two questions that are before us. Would you like to take? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> uh, this is part of the, I mean, when you talk about the un, uh, unintended, I think essentially you're saying that in many poor countries, uh, children have to work. Uh, and if you simply say, no child labor, period, I, I hope you're not saying that, but, but if you just say that, uh, that's not a good way to proceed. Actually, unless I know that there are NGOs working, governments working, including foreign governments like German government on drug mark, you know, I mean, they've shifted to working, you know, uh, with NGOs, et cetera. And if I know that they're actually taking children off work, but making sure they get to schools, making sure that the parents don't keel over and so on, if I didn't know that, if you gave me a, a, a little, <laughs> a label saying made with child labor, I would probably buy it rather than not buy it because that supports the family. So I think the, I mean, this is why, it's, not, it's a whole shebang of things which I don't have to explain to the two of you, but as soon as you start putting it down as a prerequisite, you know, before we let you do anything, that is something which I, sort of worries me, you know, about this approach. I mean, I know where you're coming from, that you really want some civil society action, but I think there's a lot of civil society actions we can have. Uh, I would even urge, I mean, once I saw some of the students against sweatshops here uh, on the steps of, you know, at the bottom of the low library steps, and I, I said, do you know that there are sweatshops down in the garment district? Uh, and, you know, I offered my pass, you know, the subway pass, and I said, why don't you go down and do something about that? Uh, and those of you who remember, you know, Robert Reich, who is a good friend of mine, the secretary, former Secretary of Labor, and that hapless woman, you know, on TV who went yeah, down, you remember, did. crying and so on. Uh, <laughs> the problem there was, there were, I think if I remember correctly, Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, there were about five or six inspectors in the country as a whole. So we were not enforcing our own laws at all. So maybe we could, you know, like charity begins at home, I mean, you are here. Why don't you start by saying U.S. itself should really enforce it, you know, these laws, and we can do a lot here because after we live here, right? And so we should be able to do that. And that would also enable us then to go to other countries and say, look, we are actually fair-minded, right? We are doing it at, at home. It's not just a way of imposing it on you. So, I mean, there are, these are the kinds of issues which sort of go through my head. Uh, the, the, the enormous fund of goodwill which mm -hmm. people have to so, his rights, labor rights, I think has to be canalized in all kinds of different ways. Uh, and nothing makes other people more cynical in developing countries than people like us coming from here, because I'm a naturalized citizen now, uh, so I'm an American <laughs> for some time. Going and lecturing to them and, I, I, you know, and saying, and they see the discrepancy between what we have, less than 10% of our labor force in um, unionized, right? We have taft hartley provisions, and I work for Human Rights Watch on Academic Advisory Committee on Asia, and there was this report <clears throat> on the fundamental right to unionize, uh, which was saying that by the Cornell professors, you see, that m millions in inverted commas, you know, quote, here are denied the right to unionize, and they, they largely it was not because you go around beating them on the head and doing unspeakable things, but largely because the under the Taft-Hartley provisions, uh, the strikes are crippled, the force of strikes is crippled, I mean, or much less, because you can't hire replacement workers, uh, or rather you can hire replacement workers, and sympathetic strikes are not allowed. So I'm in favor of the SEIU, et cetera, as against the FLCIO, because the FLCIO is concentrating on foreign uh, actions and so on. We need to unionize very rapidly here and have our workers actually get benefits. Then we can go and talk to other people more effectively, I feel. But anyway, it's just a thought. Okay, so did you want to deal with the boycott? Mark, did you would want to say any words on the boycott concern? No, okay. Well, 
Just a couple of quick thoughts. I mean, I, I agree with Professor Bhagwati that it's a very important to focus on labor rights issues in the U.S., but I think there's no question that it is true that the U.S. labor movement and labor rights advocates in general do that. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, if we're going to talk about the AFL-CIO, I mean, their, their current obsession, my own view appropriately so, is achieving changes in U.S. labor law that will address exactly the problem Professor Bhagwati described of the uh, enormous difficulties that workers now have in the U.S. in exercising their, their right to organize. So I agree entirely uh, that charity begins at home, but I think if you actually look at the work over the last decade and a half that the groups who work on sweatshop issues have done, unions, student activists, uh, academic labor rights advocates, many other organizations, they have in fact uh, focused on policy in the U.S. as well as policy overseas. On the child labor issue, I think it's important to note in countries in which there are high levels of unemployment, there's no economic justification for allowing child labor. If children are working in a, a rug factory uh, in Pakistan uh, or India or making soccer balls uh, in Pakistan, they're displacing jobs that would, they're displacing adults from those jobs. If child labor is removed from that factory, the jobs will be done by adults. You have to ask why does the factory to prefer to employ children. It prefers to employ children because it can pay children less and children are less able to exercise and defend their rights in the workplace. So the net effect of allowing child labor uh, in the industrial context is to further impoverish the country because the amount of income earned uh, by the working class in that country is lowered rather than raised. And if you remove child labor from the factory, adults will work at the factory earning more income and will be in a better position to support their families so children don't have to work. So I do very strongly disagree that, that uh, there's something positive about child labor in, in apparel factories. I think economically as well as morally, there's tremendously strong evidence that there isn't anything positive. And it is also worth noting that labor rights advocates globally have embraced the point that if you do remove child labor, from a factory, from a country, it is important to have transitional programs that ensure that children do get to school uh, and that families do not suffer too much economic dislocation. Thanks. And I'll also just respond to your question about child labor and from our own experience. Uh, we had a Swiss company come to us who do make cotton seeds and they were exposed as having child labor on their farms, their cotton seed farms in India. And they didn't believe that this was true. So they sent someone, it was, it was exposed in all of the European media. So they sent someone out to India. And he came back a week later and he said, no, in fact, we don't have child labor anymore. We used to have child labor, but when we discovered it a couple of years ago, we instructed the farmers that they could not use children. We put it in the contract, and so we no longer have children. We actually stamp it on our bags that they're child labor free. But they came to us and said, look, can you give us a methodology for monitoring this and for preventing this? So we said, sure, but let's go out and have a look at your supply chain and see what kind of a methodology we could put together. We went out there and we found that the farms all had kids on them. And so we pointed out to the company that barring the use of child labor in the contract, making it a legal, a legal requirement, was not going to change anything in the local reality. And on those farms, the fact of the matter is that the family farms the farm. It's a one-acre plot. And in the morning, the whole family goes out to the plot. They work there all day, and they come back in the evening. There are no schools in the village. So if the family didn't take the kids with them, they would literally be alone in the village. And the farmers believe that their children are going to take over the farm from them one day, so they need to learn to farm. So socially, there's no pressure against child labor. So when we sat down with all of the stakeholders concerned, the NGOs, the, the village committees, the multinational companies, and the local companies, and we said, how are we going to address this? We realized that banning it would not change anything. In fact, the government of Andhra Pradesh did ban it, and they forced the kids off the farms, and they just went into construction and match manufacturing. So they just displaced the problem. So we said, okay, we can't ban it, we're going to have to create educational opportunities for the kids, but we've got an obstacle with the families because we've got to convince the families that it's better for the kids to go to school than to, than to farm. So we needed a, to persuade parents and elders. We needed to create opportunities, and all of this could only be done through a multi-stakeholder initiative. No single actor had the solution to that particular problem. You know? So we've put together a, 
a stakeholder forum now to try and discuss these options. Very interestingly, what the companies have agreed to do, the companies at the table, and I've, I've got to tell you, it's only the multinational companies at the table. Um, 200 seat companies, and when the rubber hit the road, three were still at the table, all of them multinationals. And they've agreed to pay a premium for, for villages who do not use, the, use ch ch uh, child labor, if it can be certified that they're not using child labor. So they're putting their economic pressure behind the other strategies that, we, that we're trying to mobilize. You know? But it is, it's very complex, it's very drawn out. Um, uh, you know, and, and there's no single, there's no silver bullet to, to resolving that issue. Okay, great, thank you. Additional questions? Short question, I guess, for Mr. Nova and just, I guess, the panel in general. You mentioned that um, part of the problem is that, um, like, government manufacturers don't quite care enough to you know, make changes. So how do you see ways of making them care more or helping them to care more? I know you mentioned the brand a little bit as, as part of that. But, like, because brand's a big thing, right? And, like, not all of the brand is about child labor and not having child labor or, like, you know, fair trade or whatever. So what ways can you think of, of making it easier for them or giving them sure. incentives? to you know, make the changes necessary? Well, I'll give you a couple of thoughts, and I'm sure others can speak to this as, uh, just as well as I can. I, mean, I don't think it's so much a question of caring. It just isn't the job of companies and institutions I to mean, care. Right. right, right. The, the, it's, it's the how do we motivate them? Yeah. And I think Orette mentioned the issue of brand image. That's been the most powerful motivator to date. I mean, in, in 1990, Nike was unwilling to acknowledge mm -hmm. that it had any moral responsibility for working conditions <laughs> in its overseas factories. And it also denied that there was any problem in those overseas factories. Well, what changed Nike from that position to a position now in which at least it officially accepts that it's responsible for those conditions? Was it a moral epiphany in Nike's corporate boardroom? No, it was pressure from activists um, that convinced Nike that, that if it didn't address the issue, there was going to be very substantial damage to its most valuable asset, which is the brand image that it assiduously cultivated over a period of many years very effectively, very expensively, uh, uh, so that they can now send letters out with just the swoosh and people will know who they are. Uh, and so that, that I think is the most significant factor in terms of private action, is focusing on, on brands and retailers who care about their brand image and convincing them that if they don't take the right steps, they'll be damaged to that brand image. That's what historically has worked. Then there's of course the whole other issue of actual regulation at the national and international level, the law which of course is another uh, potentially effective mechanism because then motivation is less of an issue if you actually legally have to do it. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll take one more question. Sarah. Um, Professor Pahwadi, disregarding your sort of unfortunate and sexist comment about that hapless woman, I'd like to ask you about your comments on um, altruism because I see what you're saying about, you know, you want to be able to choose what you support for people in poor countries and really bad working situations. But it seems like it's sort of a trickle-down model where we have a system that creates poverty and then we decide how we should fix these people li people's lives rather than creating a system that actually allows workers to make money on their own and decide how best to improve their lives. So I'm wondering, I guess, for you in particular, but also for the other panelists, how we can really address the issues of giving people agency to make decisions about their lives rather than having <coughs> systems that only enable us to give charitably to causes that we believe are most important for them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't quite know what the impact of that on the current discussion is, but I, I would say that uh, when you take globalization, uh, the many ways in which actually it empowers people and you know moves from the bottom up, like take uh, immigration, which actually we should be in favor of. All of you should vote for, you know, freer immigration, because that, you know, there's a lot of evidence that the money from immigration, you know, the remittances actually go to the people themselves, and then that's that's developed from below and doesn't intermediate through through the government. So that's a very fantastic improve, you know, thing. So I think there are lots of ways in which we can, you know, give them agency, as you say, or empowerment, or you know, go from the bottom up. So I, I think this is something which is not contrary to the spirit of globalization in my view at all. Uh, and two, you do empower people, like very rapid growth, 
by enabling people to come in here, you know, on, on trade, uh, for example, does in fact, and, and letting multinationals go and create employment does empower people. And I, as I gave the Chinese example, for instance, you know, where people have been empowered and people are able to enforce their rights which are on the books, people are able to earn higher wages. So it's not either or. I mean, you know, you, you, I think you can uh, use globalization as, you know, including trade and investment and so on in a way which actually does give empowerment to a lot of poor people. And I think there's a lot of evidence for that. So I don't think there's, uh, should we then insist on certain ways in which people might want to, uh, to do things, you know, like um, what we've been discussing? I mean, I have, you know, different views on, you know, which way I would, I would do it. But when I, when I say, look, I'm going to do altruism by giving money, like, you know, I have a tiny sum of money compared to Bill Gates. Uh, but, you know, I, I give, give it to anti-malaria research. I give it to child, you know, uh, there are, I think as you know, because he's, he was describing the high-low program, which is heavy lifting. And I mean, I know my own brother was a human rights activist, uh, former chief justice of India and so on. And he, he, he's working with 40,000 villages in India where the ILO type of approach is being used, very heavy lifting. So I guess a little money there, which is all I can do, you know. And so those are the kinds of things which I think are very important. Uh, and I give to some women's groups, and, but you know, I don't earn that kind of money, but, but lots of, you know, those are ways in which you empower people. But I, I would prefer, like choices. I mean, like Mao, you know, Mao said let a hundred flowers bloom, but then you want to chop them off. <laughs> I said, let a hundred flowers bloom. If you've got a great idea, I might change my mind and do something with you. Said, I might even give money for, for your cause because, you know, I do believe in workers' well, rights. I mean. <laughs> in workers' rights. I mean, so, but it's not high on my pecking order right now in terms of how I can help the developing countries. But there is a rights approach because it, it sounds like I'm paternalistic. And should people have rights? Well, of course they should have rights. But I think except for very fundamental rights, uh, uh, we, we can't get there. You see, my, my worry about going by the, say, ILO, the core, core web, those are at the level of constitution writing, like we won't discriminate, right, against women and, and on rape. Uh, we will have the right to unionize. But those are like what we built into constitution. <laughs> I'm trailing into Marx territory. But we, that is just a chapeau. <laughs> we can all agree on them, right? But I think what we need is agreement on the narrow, specific applications, like, you know, like I may be against torture, period, but I can get agreement on not tearing up fingernails and shooting uh, or knifing uh, trade union leaders and stuff like that, but I might have a little more problem, you know, extending that to, to the kinds of things you're worried about. So I, my view on rights, is that we should go, we all are agreed, most of us, uh, on the core ILO rights, but that is only an overall umbrella. What we want to do is to move from the ground up uh, and say, what, where, where do we get universality, where people will agree on some, and then start building them up gradually into a mandatory code. But it will take time, right? And we can get agreement on some very basic things like the right to I mean, right to unionize in the sense of not being able to, you know, go and break people's heads and stuff like that, which I don't see why not. I mean, you know, I mean, sometimes I joke about, like, on a TV program, um, the radio program, the guy thought I was just a devil with horns talking about something, and he said, don't you know, do, do you know which country has, you know, kills trade union workers? And I, I, I could have died, you know, in, lynched actually, but I, I just couldn't help saying, yes, I know, uh, United States, Jimmy Hoffa, and you know, and then the guy just exploded. <laughs> 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 but of course, I mean, we, he was talking about South America, in particular where you have, uh, like in Colombia, you know, a fair amount of trade union leaders being killed. So those are the kinds of things we can agree on, I think. And then we build it up and make it, make it a greater menu I think you're starting in a, at the level of detail, which I don't think we can get much agreement on uh, as far as you know, the other countries are concerned or, or even within our country. I mean, you know, 
So that's my reply. Mark, did you have any comments to that? <laughs> Can't top that. Can't top that. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming, and we really appreciate this. It was a very effective dialogue, and I want to thank all the panelists for being here and for contributing to a very important role, and this is a conversation that Columbia will continue to have. Thank you very much. Thank you.